Welcome to the Living Consciously TV show, coming to you live from our Denver, Colorado studios. I'm your host, as well as your moderator, and our theme today is how to access peace in the moment. What a theme. Let me introduce you to our guest cast and also our entire Self Evolution cast. Our guest cast today is Dina Proctor, and she's an author, and she's joining us from the Big Apple. Welcome to the show, Dina. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And we also have in the studio with me Jenna Cook. Yep. She's also part of our uh, Self Evolution and health ca Healthcast, and she is living right here in the backyards. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. All right. <laughs> awesome to have you. And we also have um, Nina de Rosa, and she's also part of our Self Evolution cast, and she's coming to us from that beautiful city called Las Vegas. Welcome to the show, Nina. Thank you, Steve. Great to have you. And uh, last but not least, Jamie Lerner. Uh, she's also part of our Staff Evolution um, cast, and she's coming, she's coming from Chicago. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be Jamie. here. Good to have you all. All right, so uh, leading question goes out to Dina, of course, always our guest guest. Uh, what does inner peace mean to you, Dina? Inner peace, I was waiting to see if that was the whole question. <laughs> that is the whole question. Okay, great. Um, inner peace to me means that I don't need any outside circumstances, whether it be people or places or uh, you know, a, a certain way of living or a certain place to live. I don't need anything outside of myself to change in order for me to be okay because my sense of self, my sense of groundedness, my sense of centeredness, and my sense of well-being can all be generated from and, in fact, always comes from within inherently you know and for many years i was mixed up and tried to you know change everything in my life different boyfriends different jobs different cities to try and find that peace and i learned the hard way around that it's only generated from inside and inner peace is like it's true freedom that's what it is for me yeah great great answer so how i'd like to move from there is all of us my experience including myself we have this and a lot of people have this idea that inner peace is something that we can achieve sometime in the future, or it's some magical moment that's going to occur in our life when we get to experience. Like, like you know, there's lots of spiritual people out there, and there's a lot of gurus out there, and, and they, they know how to generate inner peace on a more consistent basis. But for us common people out here, um, that's just something we aspire to, that sometime, someday, we're going to experience inner peace. And so I think we can prove that today on the show, that that's not so. So let's, let's go to our inner conversations. Dina, are you, what's your inner conversation is like in, in your head? Where's inner conversation. Oh, sorry. It <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, what are my inner conversations like? Well, like during the day, uh, as you go through life, what, yes. what is your inner conversation is My like? My inner conversations are very, very organized as to, to how I proceed my day and how I go through with my day. Um, I'm an extremely organized person regarding business. My fun life is a little more scattered, <laughs> which, is, which it should be because I don't really particularly want that planned out. I like it to sort of... I like spontaneity very, very much so. So I'm sort of prepared for that and I'm ready to, you know, have a nice time. Business wise, no. Business wise, I'm very, very centered. I know the direction I'm going and I know what I have to do, certain things I have to do during the day. So I have a very um, peaceful feeling within my body and within myself thinking of how my day goes. And it's usually, um, it's usually, unless something, happens suddenly <laughs> that I'm unaware of. But even then, I think in life we are prepared for the unknown and we, in our own way, handle it the best way we can and we get through it and we move on. At least that's what I do. Okay, please, please stop using we and replace we with I. And um, my next question to you, uh, Ninan, is do you have negative thoughts in your head, negative conversations? And if you do, if that's a yes, what do you do with them? Do I, have neg do I have negative thoughts from somebody else? No. Do you have negative conversations in your head? With myself? 
Yeah. Very rarely. No, I, I don't have negative conversations. Never? I, no, well, never's a long word. My father told me there was no such word as never, so we'll take the never <laughs> bit <Okay>. out. <laughs> so you do have negative, so the answer is yes, I do have negative conversations. So if you do, what do you do with them? I didn't say I had them. You said I had them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let me ask the question again. Is, okay. is your answer to the question, do I have negative conversation no. in my head, is the answer no. yes or no? No. No. You don't? No. Okay. Okay, so let me switch to uh, <laughs> Dina for a second. Dina, do you have negative conversations in your head? Me? Sometimes, yeah. Okay, and what I, do you do I with them? Think of, yeah, here, I, I, I think of thoughts as being the indicators or symptoms of how connected or disconnected I am in the moment. So I use them as an indicator. So usually I don't, ha you know, the majority of the time, say while I'm driving, I used to when I was in depression and really disconnected, I would have horribly negative thoughts about other drivers and, you know, like what's wrong with you and just all these critical judgmental thoughts. But I believe that they were like, they were an indicator or a symptom that I was disconnected from my own inner sense of centeredness and well-being. So today, I don't have many of those thoughts anymore. A lot of times I don't have thoughts at all. I just kind of am moving through reality with a, a lot of space around what's going on, which is great. Uh, or if I do notice that I'm slipping into those negative thoughts, I just think, aha, I don't have to do something with that thought itself because the thought itself doesn't inherently mean something. It doesn't mean I need to fix my attitude towards those drivers or whatever. What it means for me is I need to get back in my routine of meditation and get back to my center because then those thoughts naturally fall away. So it's not that I have to solve a problem or figure out where that thought came from or confront the person that's making me, you know, <laughs> inspiring the thought inside of me, it's just an indicator because those thoughts wouldn't even be on my radar if I'm calm and centered. So they happen to me, yes, but that's what I do with them and that's how I handle them. Oh, fantastic. And I have a question for yeah. uh, Dina. How did you start your journey into going down and having peace in the moment for our viewers? Because a lot of people don't even have a clue how that to do that. So how did you start that journey? Well, my story, I will say totally accidentally and not wanting to. <laughs> That's what happened for me. Like about four years ago, I hit rock bottom in my life. I actually hit rock bottom twice. And I was so, um, I, I lived my, my whole life up until, this is four years ago, into my early 30s, um, you know, like with willpower and stamina and, you know, like, I can do anything and I, I made that job happen and I got those good grades and that willpower type of attitude. And when things didn't go my way or I wasn't finding peace even in things that I thought would bring me peace, you know, I just thought, oh, if I just get that car, I'll feel good. If I just get that boyfriend, I'll feel good. If I can just get that job and move to that city, that'll be it, you know, like, so that was how I lived my life. And in my 20s, I went in and out of depression and I changed so many things in my life and I was in and out of depression so many times, I just started thinking, I don't want to live anymore. If this is all it's going to be, just, I, I want out, you know? So I started praying that I would not wake up in the morning. Like, those were my thoughts going to bed. And in my late 20s, I started drinking. I was always a normal drinker, like, from college and all that. It was never a problem. But something switched, and alcohol became something you know, like the solution for me. And I had constant alcohol in my bloodstream for probably two or three years. And that's what brought me to hit rock bottom was my addiction, my depression, my secret drinking, and I literally had a date planned for my suicide. So that after I hit mm -hmm. bottom with that, that was the only thing that could get through my thick head, you know, that something needed to change. And I ended up joining an addiction recovery program for a year. And after three months of resisting everything, I just gave in completely, you know, and went through the program. So that was my catalyst. But I always tell people, like, you do not have to hit bottom before you start climbing back up. You know, the key is to reach a place where you can set aside everything you think you know for an open mind and a new experience. And that's not easy. That It's not easy to set aside things that have been working for you or thoughts and beliefs and attitudes you've hold, held your whole life or things that are working okay but could be much greater. You know, like we, it, it's, um, it's like we have a temperature thermometer. We like a, a room at a certain temperature and we're most comfortable in that temperature. If it gets a little hotter or a little colder, if it's, if it's 
unbearable, we will make the change. But if it's like we can kind of compensate with extra blankets or whatever, you know, then we don't make that change. So I had to be pinched to the point of not having a choice. It was like I'm either taking my life or I'm trying on a new completely set of beliefs and way of living. Yeah, um, so you know, thank you. Thank you really for mm -hmm. sharing that. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what I call a really authentic share. So thank you so much for sharing that with us and with our viewers. And I'd sure. like to switch to Jamie. Jamie, do you have any negative thoughts during the day or during the night? And if you do, how do you handle them? Um, I think that I've gotten really good at training myself into um, the being sensitive enough to know when I am having a negative thought. And um, I'm able to reframe it pretty quickly. I don't have a lot of tolerance for not feeling good. Um, so it, it happens more for me in a feeling. If I get an inkling that something isn't feeling good for me, I immediately check in with myself and ask myself what I'm thinking about. And if it's negative, and it usually is, then I just reach for a thought that feels better. But it's taken a lot of practice, and I've trained myself very well into a place of well-being um, over a period of time. And, and that works really well for me. So that's okay. what I do. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. What about you, Janet? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So um, you're do you asking. Do you have negative thoughts? Presently? Not presently. <laughs> just just, just normally at, just going normal, through your normally. regular days. Yeah, normally. Uh, I would say sometimes I do. You know, I'm human, so yeah. I will have that. And for me, myself, how I go and know that it's negative is I feel it in my body. It's like there's something not right. It, and the negativity may be, um, say, I don't want to go on this trip. And there's just something about that. And so I really have to set with it, really feel it in my body, and really work through a process. You know, I can't go, and it's gone. It doesn't work that for me because things tend to kind of reside in my body. I can tell you there's something negative in my hip that I've been feeling about a day. So that's something that's working its way out. But yes, I do. And what do you do? Well, this? as I do, as I sit with it, I really ponder, is there something that, for example, if it's an issue with a, a person, I sit with it and feel it in my body and really speak to my heart and say, do I need to be direct and more authentic with this person about a situation. And, I, and then I say, yes, that's what I need to do, and then I will address the situation. Okay, great, fantastic, okay. thank you. All right, so I'm gonna give my own example for a second here. So, so I remember uh, quite clearly when I used to be in corporate America and I had to go in and speak to uh, one of the big bosses. I was working for a very large uh, CPA firm and um, uh, I ended up, um, you know, we had an appointment, and I ended up designing um, uh, before I went into the meeting what I was going to say, how I was going to say it, and what's going to happen. The whole script. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure nobody has ever had an experience like this. Yeah. Only me. So I went into the meeting, and guess what? It turned out absolutely completely differently than how I designed it. And um, uh, during the meeting, as my boss was talking to me, I wasn't able to be present because. I was disturbed. Because <laughs> he didn't go by the script. How <laughs> come it's not turning out the way I wanted it to turn out? So I missed out on the entire meeting because I couldn't be in the present moment. So, uh, but I did say in my head that, well, based on some of the things that I caught, which probably less than 10% of what he said, next time when I have an opportunity, mm -hmm. so now I went from the past, I went to the future, next time when I have an opportunity to have this meeting, I'm going to let him have it because now I know what to do. Ah. So guess what? Did it work? <laughs> no. 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 It didn't work because I spent most of my energy and time either in the past or in the future, and I completely missed out on the present moment, mm -hmm. on the moment. So that's really what I want to focus on right now in the show because I feel our theme is so fantastic because it is about how to access peace in the moment. It is so fantastic because the only place I feel that, and I want everybody's input, where peace is available is by learning how to be in the moment. And by listening. Yes. And, and being connected, being connected to ourselves and to each other. And by listening and not wanting to say, oh, I'm going to say this once, you know, like mm -hmm. this, but by simply being present and being here and listening and connected. Yeah. 
So I have another quick example that happened to me today, actually. This is like so vivid. So I was, uh, I was working in my, in my studio, uh, at my, in my house, and I noticed that there was all this noise outside, outside of my house, and the noise was um, the city came and was digging up the street. <laughs> on Saturday? And it, yeah, on Saturday. And, and it was really noisy, and, and my, my conversation in my head was saying, you know, that's a lot of noise, and you really can't work when it's that noisy. And, uh, you know, at that moment, I had a choice. You know, I checked in my, with myself, and I'm going, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, I don't have to stop working. Um, and, and the fact that you telling me, and who's the you that was telling me is my ego, because my ego was trying to mm -hmm. protect me and said, well, it's too noisy. You can't possibly turn out anything good when it's that noisy. And I said, you know what? Um, I can. Thank you for sharing that with me. But, you know, I can just quiet that noise down. I'm not even focusing on it, and I'm going to go back and focus on what I'm doing right mm -hmm. now. And that's coming back into the present moment of what was important to me, and I was able to continue to work. So that's just another example, because it, it just happened a couple of hours ago. So does anybody on the cast or our guest cast, uh, Dina, anybody has a, an example like this that happened to you today or yesterday, something vivid that you still recall? Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that we always have that choice. And I think that's really important that we um, share that with the viewers and each other. And knowing that the only thing that we really have control over at any given moment is what we're choosing to think about and how we're choosing to feel. And that reminder to ourselves at all times helps us kind of um, rely on ourselves in any situation where we're feeling particularly um, misaligned. Like this morning, you know, you were saying you were misaligned because of your expectation to be able to do work and what was going on outside. And, and I find myself doing that like all the time, like all day long, where I'm allowing myself to realign myself based on um, maybe what's happening around me that, you know, is a little distracting from what I would like to be doing. And it, I think it's a good tool you know, that we can kind of uh, reach inward and um, say to ourselves, okay, you know, how can I control the situation for me? You know, I'm not going to change anyone else, but what can I do for me in terms of changing how I'm thinking about this or how I'm feeling about this? So I think I do it all the time, all day long. Yeah, so what I'm hearing there is, is, is that you're becoming aware of what's it's, going on around absolutely. you, right? Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's an inner awareness, and it's not using everyone else as my excuse to not do well. It's actually using everyone as my excuse to do well. So, you know, I, I think that we could do it either way, you know. We could use people as our excuses to be the least, or we could use people as our excuses to be the best. And choice, all choice. So. Okay. Well, we went, thank you, thank you so much. So I, I think we just went through with these examples to show our viewers what is it like to be in the now. And, and maybe if we could maybe spend a little more time on this, um, that would be, that could be transformational for some people. So I'm experiencing, or at least I used to experience in the past um, when I was not aware and not conscious is that I would be running around all day long doing all kinds of things and responding to what's happening outside in the outside world and um, was very busy uh, reacting. And uh, when I become more aware and more conscious, I, I don't react so much to what's happening and what's coming at me from the outside world. And I'm wondering, uh, does anybody ha has any specific tools uh, or any modalities that we can share with the viewers, how to get centered and how to come back into the moment. Because I, I feel that that's a huge missing in, mm -hmm. in how we live our lives right now. Especially in corporate America and mm -hmm. in, in what's happening in the world today with everybody. It is. It's very mm -hmm. difficult for that. My sense is, from my own experience, I think for people to start moving into living consciously, there has to be a significant emotional event as Dina pointed out. Mm 
She hit rock bottom. I don't think you're just walking down the, the street one day and you're, you know, you're in corporate America and you have kids and, and you're doing all this stuff that all of a sudden you can, something hits you and like, bing, I think I'll become conscious. It doesn't work that way. I, I, I just don't believe that. I think something has to happen in your life that really has to stop you in your tracks, that makes you stop and you look and you say, what am I doing? You know, how come, how come all this stuff is, is uh, dominating my life and I'm not really happy? So that would, that would be my input for any viewer is that um, it's great if you can try to go down that way, but my sense with human nature and what happens with us in our life and our body, something has, to, there has to be a trigger that makes us, be, makes us stop in our tracks. Hmm. And then we have to do that. Hmm. Interesting. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, okay, got it. So I, I feel that um, that's true, what you just said, that's very true. Now, there may be some people that come but, awake there, but I think yeah. most of the time it's that way. But, but I also believe that there are lots of people out there right now, especially right now, that, that they've been questioning. A lot of people, I think millions of people are questioning why they are here, what's the purpose of their lives, what are they supposed to be doing, you know? Because mm -hmm. people are waking up to the fact that, guess what? If, if you go through the normal um, programming of our own DNAs, which is, you know, we, we are born, right. then we go through... Um, you know, growing up with our parents, and then we become teenagers, and then we become 20s and 30-something, mm -hmm. and then we do what we're supposed to do by society standards, right. um, which is get married, have, have babies, kids, right. you know, have the car, have the, house. have the house, and then when all that's done, then you go, is this all there is? Well, the kids leave, Yeah. so now you don't have anybody, and you're sitting there with your spouse. <laughs> well, you know, I think it was easier when that was really all you were to do, is just get married <laughs> and have kids, and that was it. I think that that it's really changed so much now, it's even more confusing. We have so many more options for what our choices are, and so the purpose, and to find our purpose, I think it's a much bigger question today than it was, you know, in a previous generation. Agreed. So, I agree. you know. Um, I have actually, I'm kind of bursting because I'm really excited to <laughs> contribute a little bit. Um, Go one of the things that I was thinking about, I love what Jamie said um, when we were talking about turning it around in the moment, being present in the moment, because one of the things that I do, uh, first of all, to stay present, and second of all, to turn around a negative thought. Uh, especially like Steve with your example of an outside circumstance and then your inner voice coming in saying, oh, this is, just give up. You know, this is not possible. I can't work under these conditions or whatever. Like, I, I ask inwardly, like, I kind of get curious. curious. Curiosity opens me up because it takes away my resistance and it brings me more into the present moment. So I would turn in and just ask myself, like, I wonder if it's possible if, even though it's never happened before, if I could get this work done, even in the face of whatever's going on here, I wonder if it's possible. So that helps me to just get curious and get kind of in the moment. And I have a process that I'd like to share with you. It, um, you know, it's, I discovered it kind of by accident, but it, it really is a process that's helped me maintain being centered and expand my connection to my innermost self. Because when we're talking about life purpose, like my life purpose, I believe, is just to be the fullest expression of my innermost self in my human form. Like, period. Whatever that would turn out to be. And I have dreams and, and goals and stuff, but if you would have asked me even two like three years ago, do you, would you ever plan to write a book or be a coach? I would say, oh no, I never want to be an entrepreneur. You know, like so. It, it's not that I would have a particular dream that I want to reach, but as I get more centered to my innermost self, it's like talents I didn't know I had are shown to me or are surfacing. So that's what I, you know, it, it takes that pressure off me rather than looking at feeling tense and, and wound up like, oh my gosh, I can't find my purpose type of thing. But the meditation process that I use, it's like a meditation visualization. And I just do three minutes, three times a day. And I started doing that after I hit rock bottom. The coach and the recovery program that I worked with told me to learn how to meditate. And I remember looking at her like, 
uh, what is that going to do for me? Like, don't you see how nuts I am right now, you know? And her instruction was to sit still for 20 minutes every morning. And I physically couldn't, just detoxing and my negative thoughts, like I just physically couldn't accomplish that, but I could sit for three. So I tried to sit for three minutes, like a few times a day in order to make it to her 20 minute quota. And it ended up being, you know, three minutes, three times a day. And what that does, especially the one in the middle of the day, because I don't think is meditation and visualization as something to check off the to-do list. Like, you know, brush my teeth, check, went to the gym, check, you know, we drove to work, check. It's like meditation is more of a state of being. And I don't mean like, oh, la la land type of thing. I mean, really grounded, centered, and present in the moment. Because I feel like in any moment, there's a best thing for me to be doing. There's either a best food for me to be eating, a best person for me to be calling, a best letter to be writing. Like in any moment, my energy is the best match for something. And if I just tune in inwardly, rather than try and plan it, you know, using my mind, but I tune in using, I, I have this warmth in my solar plexus area when I really feel grounded and centered, and that's what I aim for. And especially that middle of the day, three minute meditation, when I take the time, and it's especially important if my day is super busy, because I'm trumping whatever I see as being more important than doing my meditation. I think of it as eating three times a day. Like if you don't nourish your body, if you're too busy to eat breakfast and lunch, by dinner time you're like, you know, you have no energy at all because you're not taking that time to nourish yourself. So I say we nourish our bodies three times a day. Why don't we nourish our spirits and our inner selves that often yeah, too? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so Dina, what do you mean by meditation? Because a lot of our viewers, I think, might be asking the question. Uh, first of all, a lot of people think that meditation is kind of weird. <laughs> and they're wondering oh, yeah. how to do it right. <laughs> yeah. Is there such well, a thing as doing it right? And talk about that a little bit. Okay. Well, for me, meditation, and it's something that I just kind of taught myself, like the only instruction given to me was to sit still and listen, to, or sit still and focus on my breathing. So what I do in meditation, I take it seven days at a time. First of all, because I have that, I've always had that New Year's resolution thing, you know, I've got like 43 things on my New Year's resolution list, and by January 17th, you're like, wait, what was I gonna do again? You know, because it's just too overwhelming. So what I do is whatever my goal is, I'm gonna commit fully to only one thing, but I'm gonna play full out for seven days. So with like a three by three meditation practice, um, my three minutes, three times a day, like the way that I started out, and or the way that I would advise a person to start out if that happened to resonate with them is just to do something very simple. Like heart math has a breathing technique, which is as you're breathing you know, normally through your nose or mouth or whatever and sitting kind of quietly, I always sit um, upright rather than laying down because that's most comfortable and alert for my body, but might be different for different people. Um, but I put on a timer so that I can lose myself in it and not just kind of be peeking, oh, is my time up yet? Has it been two minutes yet or whatever? So I do those couple things. And then just for those seven days, I hold the same intention. So I might do that heart math breathing I was saying. So instead of as I breathe in and out here, I'm picturing the breath going in and out of my heart space. So energy, nutrients, centeredness, you know, positive energy coming in, swirling through my body, grabbing anything that needs to leave and exhaling through the heart. So that's something very simple that people could start out with for seven days. But I've used three by three in a very focused way, and this is when I, you know, a, a year or two into it, so I was very practiced with it, but I've lost weight doing it, I've lowered my cholesterol doing it, you know, so like anything is possible, I believe, in the meditation is more of just a quieting your mind space and since you can't fill a cup that's already overflowing, if your mind is already full of thoughts, you can't be putting in new ideas. You kind of have to create space for new ideas. And that's what that heart math breathing or even something as simple, Steve, as like finding your pulse and counting your heartbeats for three minutes because it's distracting yourself from whatever's got you wound up or tense or, you know, like you know you've accomplished something in your meditation if when you come out of it, you kind of look around for a second and be like, what was I doing before I sat down? Then you know you accomplished it because you've broken that train of thought, mm, you know? Fantastic. Mm, yeah, yeah. That, that's like the beginner, like 101, I guess. Yeah, great. How to do it. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to Jamie for a second. So Jamie, how do you know when you're in the present moment and when you're not? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Oh, sure. <laughs> do how do you know, <laughs> <laughs> how, what indications 
or how do you how do you realize when you're connected to the present moment or when you're not um, I think that when I am connected to myself I am connected to the present moment and mm. um, I am so focused and and I'm so familiar with what that feels like that um, it becomes almost pain, I become painfully aware of when I'm not. And I think that's what happens, that the more we're connected to ourselves, then um, it's almost unbearable to be disconnected. You know, okay. it's almost like the opposite. So you practice, and the better you feel, the better you feel. And when you feel good, you don't want to not feel good. So yeah, yeah. I it. think you just get really sensitive to the, the feeling and the experience, and then you are able to eventually bring yourself back around pretty quickly. So. Okay, great. So when you're not connected, what do you do then? Well, to come when back I'm not into being connected. Uh, when I'm not, I just immediately kind of look inward and shift, make a shift. It's a mental shift for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I I shift mentally into a better feeling place. It's never usually about the thinking, it's more about the feeling. So, okay. um, and sometimes I have to visualize something to get to that better feeling place, but I don't have a very high tolerance for not feeling good. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so <laughs> Dina. Just, I, I don't. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. So Dina was talking about this early in the show where she ended up um, having a drinking problem, a drinking addiction, because she was avoiding being in the present moment. And I think she was also avoiding how to handle the conversation within her mind. Now, we know there are lots of different addictions that people can go to or have uh, to distract themselves from the present moment. Um, are we then saying that when you're addicted to something, <laughs> you just, you're just unwilling at the moment to, to be present to the truth? But once moment. again, you know, I think, and I, I say this a lot, that it's okay. It's If you are distracted and you are able to say to yourself, you know what, I'm choosing to be distracted right now because I am not interested in being in the present moment, that is a choice. And if we can at least get there, I think that's halfway. Then we're choosing to be distracted. And sometimes a distraction is not a bad thing if we've chosen it. And it's my, when yeah. we become a victim to... Um, the, to being disconnected, I think that then there's that's more of an issue. Um, and my and sense with addiction is that people with any type of addiction they need. Have you to ever feel, had one? No. Knock on wood. Darn it. I know. I never drank. I never smoked. I never did anything. <laughs> but but my sense of working with people uh. is, and I and I'm you know kind of the body healer is it makes them feel better. It takes away the pain, and it could be emotional pain, it could be physical pain, but what it could be gambling, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, but that high, it takes them like out of their body, and they feel better. And that's what we all wanna do, is we wanna feel better. So are you saying that that's not a bad thing? I, I say that that's a piece of survival for somebody. I can't be critical of somebody going through pain I mean, I think it's a process for him. I think sooner or later, like Dina said, she hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And you can't help somebody that doesn't want to help themselves, unfortunately. It doesn't work. So when somebody hits rock bottom, then they can get the therapy and the support and the help they need to start that process to healing. But, I mean, that was a re really good question. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to criticize anybody on addiction because there's okay. a reason why they're doing that. Okay, I want to ask yeah. Nina because she's back. Good. She's <laughs> back. Ninon, Ninon, have you ever been addicted to anything? Oh, lots of things. <laughs> Give us some examples. You caught me. You caught, well, um, example was uh, cigarettes. I was a smoker. Oh. Oh my God! Yeah. I never knew I was, that about you. Ah. <laughs> wow. It's all coming out. Yeah, I was a smoker. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know if I was rebelling um, when I started smoking. I probably was. I started when I was 16, Ooh. and it went on and off for many years. And then it, you know, the first thing, getting up in the morning, putting the makeup on, and a lovely cigarette. It was a Sherman's. I used to love to smoke Sherman's, and they were these long black cigarettes, were probably totally deadly, but. To me, they weren't. <laughs> and how I got off it was that I would have the cigarettes in my apartment, and it was either me or the cigarette. And who was stronger? The and cigarette. that's actually how I quit. 
Uh, I quit with them being there because I didn't want this little silly little thing to be stronger than me because that's not me. Because I feel like I feel I'm a very strong woman and I can handle it. And I and I did handle it. It was really tough. Then I met my husband. Oh my goodness, well, his boyfriend at that time, and he was a smoker. <laughs> so, <laughs> believe it or not, I went back into it. Ah. I wow. went back into it, and you wow. And it was a very sad story that took me off it. My husband and I arrived in Rome, and he suddenly went very, very pale. And he was sitting on the floor because he, he couldn't really move. And I was looking at him, and I thought, oh my goodness, it's the cigarettes that are doing this. And I gave up again, and I've never smoked since that day because I was so frightened. And it hit, hit me, certainly hit him, but it hit me really, really bad that if I love this person that much, that I have definitely got to have the strength again because I quite like smoking. And I actually had to do it again, and, and I haven't smoked since then. I may have had a couple of cigars, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see that. I, I can admit, visualize that, yes. I have smoked cigars, and if someone offered me a cigar oh. right now, I would smoke it. But it doesn't oh mean I've got a habit, I'm addicted. But yes, I would. Yeah. Great. So, 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 Dina, if I was in the Big Apple right now and I called you up and said, um, could you come meet me in bar so and so, have a drink, what would you say? Well, the alcohol doesn't affect me that way anymore. I don't have. Mm -hmm a negative or positive, it's like a glass of wine looks like a glass of iced tea to me, the where I, the where I am now. Mm. So that isn't a trigger for me anymore. So it doesn't, have you, to, doesn't have you anymore? No, it doesn't. Mm. And I wanted to comment because I loved what, um, uh, I want to say your name right, Ninan? Ninan, yes. Ninan, yeah. Ninan okay, yeah. what you just said. Because the way, and, and that's what I was saying before, it's like you don't have to hit rock bottom before you start climbing up, but for many people it takes that because you've got to reach a point where there's something that trumps whatever your issue is. There's got to be something that's more important. So, you know, you had two examples of things that were more, that became more important to you than hanging on to that cigarette thing. And I think everyone is always doing the best that they can in every moment you know like when i was drinking that's the best i could do because i needed to soothe that discord it really was like i was at that such a low but everyone is 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 doing that and the drinking and the smoking it's not the problem that's the solution you know that's the solution a temporary a solution yeah would you have a drink right now could you have one drink yeah i can you i can. have over this yeah yeah, it's part of my healing. Um, I went through, in states of higher consciousness, I just knew that cells in my body were rewired. And so I've had, probably over the last year, I've had maybe six times I've had a glass of wine. And it oh, just, it amazing. doesn't, the that thing is, is, yeah, the thing is, though, and I would never, ever advise anyone who has an addiction to try and make that their ultimate goal. Because I, I, I think of it as, um, you know, like the recovery program I went through saved my life. It was amazing. If anyone listening has an addiction, that's what I would say. My story is really unusual, but I believe that there's, because when I have a glass of wine now, it clouds me. I don't like the way it makes me feel. It doesn't give me that buzz or that high that I always wanted. But when I was at like this part on the scale, when I was like in negative, it brought me up to neutral or positive. But now I'm usually up here. So if I have a drink, it drags me down here. It doesn't work anymore. It clouds me. I don't like it. So it's it's not something it's that it's an appeals alignment to. issue. I mean, all yeah. addiction is alignment. And yeah. and if we are in alignment with what we're doing, then it doesn't it can't harm us, I believe. Yeah. So I always believe it's the Lyman issue, no matter what the substance is. Do you so, think that most people that are alcoholics that actually go off this, you know, they stop drinking and they're actually um, afraid to have another drink in case they go back or they just don't want one? No, I think it's Lena. fear. I think they're afraid fear. that they don't trust themselves. And they don't try, I yeah. think that they don't work on that alignment piece because I think if they're already from that place of feeling so good, chose to have a drink, I don't think that it would affect them the way they it did when they chose to have that drink to feel better. And there's a huge difference. To reach for something in order to feel better as opposed to from that good feeling place, use it as a way to... Um, accentuate feeling good, I think that that's different, very different, so. Yeah, this is, re this is really cool. So a few months ago, I uh, was in Las Vegas meeting with, um, with Ninan and uh, many other people. I was there for like several days, almost a week. 
-hmm. And I used it as a test uh, for me. Um, to you see did? If I, <laughs> to see if I can go through the entire week without gambling. And Ninon, believe me, has taken me through a few uh, casinos. And um, I, did not, I did not gamble, not one quarter. I, but I have to mention one thing, Steve, that I, I didn't take you to the casinos purposely to test you. Oh, no, I, I know. I know. I know you didn't. You were on this test. But I have to say that, no, he did not gamble. But I was, that, not, was that hard for you, Steve? No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It, it, was it wasn't hard at all. Right? It was like the way I was feeling, it was like it flashed kind of in front of me uh, time to time uh, that I used to be sitting in front of those machines and com I was completely ob oblivious to the world, and I used gambling to take my, you know, attention off of all of my problems and all mm -hmm. of my internal stuff. Right. It, it did a great job um, for to, provide that, to provide that for me. It also, I also probably spent over a half a million dollars doing it. <laughs> that, that's not so good. That's not so good. It was so a cover-up. Um, yeah, it was a cover-up. No, that, yeah. <laughs> that was a cover-up. But, but it, was really, it, was, it was really like, I felt like I was going through fire and I was going through the other side. Mm -hmm. it's like, it was like after I finished that week in Las Vegas, I said, hey, I must be cured because I didn't have, like, I didn't have that urge like I can, I can tell you that when I was in it, I would, I would like, I was like an automatic pilot. Like if I had money, and, and it could be a hundred bucks, it could be whatever money I had, Zip, gone. I would be in my car and I would be gone. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what, even if, even if the closest person that, that, that loved me and I loved. Mm -hmm. That the gambling was that more important. But you know what? That was just a disconnection that you had with yourself, and now you're connected to yourself. And when you're connected to our, when we are connected to ourselves, then we don't have any triggers. There are no nothing can trigger us when we are in that place. Yes, of it's a beautiful being place to be. Connected. I, I just want all the viewers. Thank you for saying that, by the way, Jimmy. I just want all the viewers to know that. This is not some kind of an utopia that we're living in, you know, because we're doing this show and we're talking about consciousness and we're talking about all this. All of this is available for everybody right Absolutely. now in the moment. Absolutely. It's not like you have to do something or there's some place to get to. It or, is or it costs something. Well, yeah. you know what I think? You, there's one thing you have to do. I think we must manage our thoughts, and it's the only thing that we can do for ourselves. And I think that that is very necessary to manage our own individual thoughts. And how yes. would you have those choices? But you know, I'd like to mention another thing that I was when I was married. I was married for 29 years. My husband was a gambler and an alcoholic. That's what I live with. Mm. And it was funny because when he passed away in 2004, not because of, of gambling or alcohol, he had a bad heart, but probably through the drinking, actually. <laughs> but I moved to Vegas a year ago, and, and I've always had this gambler. Both my grandfathers were gamblers. And I seem to have this thing within me that I, I seem to be able to take control of it because I truly like to gamble. I really do. I see the crap tables. But it's funny, I'm living, I've lived here for a whole year, and I may have gambled twice. And I think one of those times was actually with Steve. And I really, um, I can take it or leave it. Unfortunately, I can leave it. I don't know whether it's I'm thinking of the consequences or whether I've, I think I have control over my mm -hmm. body and I think mm -hmm. I understand the consequences and I also understand what I want to choose and, and it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter to anybody else as long as I know what's going to be good for me within me and as long as I can control that and take those choices and, and keep this straight road which obviously I'm not an addictive person because if I was I would still be smoking and gambling. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Well, well yeah. I think you're a connected person. And so, you know, you choose to do what you choose to do from a place of connection, which is more about pleasure and not yes. about addiction. And I think that there's a big distinction between pleasure and addiction. Pleasure yeah. is from a connected place of enjoying something lovely. And you know what? Pleasure is a good thing. And that's it why people are asking, you're asking before about being negative. I'm not negative. I don't, I don't get that side of life. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be around any negative people. I do not want them in my life. I, I just don't want them there because I, I just don't like that place. I don't want to be in that place. I'm, I'm, I'm a happy spirit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fantastic. So actually, a um, couple of things. 
um, Ninon said something really important, and, and that was about um, that she, she is on control, she's in control now, and she understands that the big word I wanted to highlight is that she's present to the consequences. And yes, I can say that when I was, when I was an addict, I didn't care about the consequences, nope. zero. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't care whatever the consequences are. Yeah. And so that's awesome. And, and then the other thing I wanted to say about what Jamie said, which is um, I, I think what, what everybody's purpose now in terms of human beings is really what she said, which is managing. That's evolution for me. When, when you say we have to learn how to manage our thoughts, to mm -hmm. me that equals human beings evolution, doesn't it? Right, but how do people Absolutely. do that? For the viewers, how do you manage your thoughts? By, and it'll be by different coming, for everyone. By coming into, no. well, for me, by mm -hmm. coming into the present moment. True, but then, then, then you would ask well, the viewers. Well, admitting who you are as well. I mean, right. trying to admit what, I, what you do and what you don't do and what's, what, what is better for you, that's admitting, admitting what you are. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, if you ask the question, are you happy with the results that you have in your life, that's a yes or no, right? True. Correct. So if you're not happy with the results, then would you like to stop what you're doing that's creating the result that's creating, and would you like to do something different? Okay. What do you say about that, by the way, uh, our beautiful guest cast, Dina? About creating results in your life, you mean? Yeah, if you're not happy with it, because everybody's wondering, you know, I heard from so many people, like, um, they say, they will say, they will criticize the show and say, well, that's working for you, but that's not working for me, and, um, and I'm not willing to even entertain uh, to do what you're, what you're basically telling us to do. And then my answer is, so are you happy? Are you happy with the results you have in your life? That's either a yes or no completely independent from what we're doing on the show. So if you're happy, fantastic. If you're not, Change something. are you Change. open to look? <laughs> Change it. Change it. Change yeah. the Are thought. you open to look that there's another possibility for you? But sometimes people, uh, fear is very limiting, and, and they may not be comfortable and, and don't know how to change their life. Yeah, but where does fear come from? Probably from within side, from their experiences. Yeah, but that fear comes from what? The ego, right? Could be. And it comes from either the past or from the future. Correct. Okay, so if we're in the past or the future, are uh, we in the present? It could that would come be from depending on where they're too. at. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I'm hoping that this show is so important because we're talking about really the essence and the purpose of this show is to, to learn how to be, how to live in the present moment, because that's where all the beauty is. Could you imagine a world where everybody was in the present moment, what that would look like? Yes. Oh, yes, I can. It would can. be fantastic. Yes, and I you can. Know that what? would be fantastic. Uh -huh. yes, I can. We wouldn't have yes. some amazing collaborative <laughs> collaborative oh, yeah. right. um, co-creation with Decisions. each other that Absolutely. would yeah. really be inspiring. Absolutely. It's, and I think it's, we're closer and closer to it every single day because there are more conscious and awake people that I come across every single day. So Yeah, that's what I do. And when I said I, I, I surround myself around um, positive people because they give me the energy and hopefully I give them the energy and then we start creating and, and things become positive and, and things become beautiful. And, but I wanted to say something about Dina was talking about when she was driving and, and people used to aggravate her, her, you know, if they cut in front of you and everything. And I just wanted to bring this back up, and I know I'm going backwards. But I did the same thing as you. I used to drive, <laughs> and I used to get so aggravated, somebody cut in front of me. And I thought to myself, uh, some time ago, I thought, well, that, that's not really right, and, and who am I to criticize that person? So then I reversed it, and I thought, okay, I'm going to pretend now that they're cutting in front of me, and that's going to help me and save me from something else along the road. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. And so that's how I got over that. I got over it by saying, I made it into a 
positive and not a negative. And I didn't get mad at this person. And then also when I see these old people driving, <laughs> and I thought, oh. And then I, I turn around, I do, I turn around, I look at them, I think, oh, they're old. You know, you've got to have patience. You've got to understand who they are. And when you start doing that, then nothing aggravates you on the road. It, it, it's just when you understand the situation, and I think you understand that for yourself, it gives you that tranquility, and then you, it gives you that energy of, of being more in control of yourself. Yeah. Oh, wow, really cool. I, so here's what's coming up for me. So is what other people are doing and saying, is that our business? Ooh, that's a good no, question. It's Probably not it's our to business. Us. It's none of our business. Mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew that was coming. What's our business? Team. And most of the time, people who are in other people's business do not want to address themselves. True. And so that's why they're in someone else's business. So, no, it's none of your business. So what's our business? Yourself. Okay, so what's our business is how we relating and how we reacting. Or if we're reacting, that's our business, isn't it? Well, I think it's... Sorry. No, sure. you go. Go, Dina, oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was going to say, it's all about, for me, my internal energy management, because I practice a thing I call pre-forgiveness. And this is something I practice on people that have annoyed me for years or in situations where the line at the grocery store is too long and I'm in a hurry, like just little annoying kind of situations. And I've used it actually on bigger things, you know, on uh, relationships that have been years and years. And I've literally changed the way that people treat me because... It's kind of like a, a, a child. A child might, you know, they have, they're kind of a clean slate, a little two-year-old or three-year-old, but the way that they react when told the same exact thing from a couple of different adults might be very different. So they're responding on their clean slate. You know, they've got a particular reaction, the reaction to the energy that the adult is exuding. You know, so they might be more compliant with one adult and more resistant with another adult. So what I'm worried about is like the way that I'm managing my energy draws people to treat me or react to me toward a certain way. So I can see that I'm in alignment if most of my relationships are going well, if you know, if lines are going quickly in front of me, or if they're just things that used to annoy me don't really annoy me anymore, like we were saying about the driving, you know? So that's what it is for me. It's not anything about that I need to change. Like what I see is um, like I, I like a polishing a stone. I might have some rough edges here or there. And if they get a snag on them from a relationship, a person, way, a person, a way a person is reacting to me, my job isn't to be like, oh, I need to change that or something needs to be different. What my job is to be like, first of all, I ask myself, like, what if I can be okay if nothing here changes? What if I can actually be okay if nothing here changes, you know? So that's something that loosens it up for me and kind of brings me back to the present moment is asking that question. If nothing changes here, can I still be okay? And then getting curious about how that would look. And then the other thing is um, knowing that the more centered and grounded I am within myself, like I have examples that it, it's funny the way that people, and I never had conversations or confrontations with people about how we need to interact with each other. I just changed the way and dropped all my resistance to anything that they were doing that was annoying me. And it almost became endearing to me, you know, or like, um, Ninon was saying with driving, whenever someone's going in, in slowly in front of me, now I think there's probably some really beautiful tree or flower right here that I would be missing mm -hmm. if I was going too fast or, you know mm, what I mean? Like yes, anything that's going on on the outside that snags on one of my rough edges, I just think, ah, an edge to be smooth. Yeah, go and then, pick up you know, something like, else. Yeah. Exactly. It's called reframing, yeah. and it's an amazing yeah. tool that gets us mm -hmm. from where we are to where we want to be. And it's our own job. It's an inside job. It has nothing to do with anyone else. And guess what? We have 100% control over that. 100%. Mm -hmm. So it's the only thing we have you know, control over that's it. That so is how, it. Do we get, how do we get people out there to, to understand? That kind of this is all they have is their body because that's all we have to work with. All the other stuff is the stuff. How do we get them to understand that, that, that they can have control of this? Because a lot of people out there, our audience, that feel that they're hopeless and they can't do anything. How, what would you like to say, Gina, to help Dina, to help them, one thing that they can sort of, to help them get into a place where you are or we all are or where we're all trying to be, that, that'll help them out there? 
Well, what, uh, what I would say is, first of all, they have to want it. And they have to want it more than anything, really. You know, so if, if, that, if, if, if it's not what a person wants, that's probably not a person that would be a match for me to advise. But if it was a person that is just struggling with it but knows that there's something there, I would say that, you know, like I've known from my experiences in like a higher consciousness state, it's not constant by any means, but I've had glimpses. And I'm fully aware that my body is only about 5% of, give or take, of who I am. 95% is that gigantic swirl of source energy that animates my body. So it's like we try and navigate and, and control these circumstances in the world, but our exterior world here is like 5%, you know? So we're looking at it, it's like switching the vision and looking at it as we're living from the inside out rather than using the outside to make the inside. So what I would advise is for them to just try on that idea, even for just seven days at a time. And so whenever a thought contrary comes to that, they might think like, hmm, if I looked at it as look, living from the inside out, what if I managed my energy to change how that person treats me and spend a couple of little three by three meditations in anticipation of a, you know, a, a it, you know, an annoying person in their life to interact with or whatever, and just try it. Because once you try it, commit to trying it. And that's why I say seven days at a time, because then you can play full out. You know, it's not like you're taking it on for the rest of your life or whatever. Okay, and Dina, Dina I'm you, sorry to, I have sorry. to interrupt you. We are actually I know, at the I end. talked so much. We are <laughs> actually at the end beautiful. of the show, I and, I, and I'm sorry, but this, this happens a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> the show always ends. <laughs> And it, ha it has to end That's right good. now. That's good. It ends up on another so, We're so all <laughs> positive. <laughs> what I, <laughs> I want to say is that, uh, to, to our viewers, is that if there's anything that you heard today, this was a really important show for me. Um, if there's anything that you heard today that touched, moved, and inspired you, please go to our website at livingconsciously.co and have any of us assist you how to live in the present moment. And uh, I want to thank, of course, um, our guest cast, uh, Dina, and of, of course, thank all you. of our I all of our too. cast members mm -hmm. as well. Um, the, the people behind the, the glass, they're technically making this happen, and also all of our viewers. So thank you very much. And um, I love you all. And of course, we'll be back yeah. always live uh, too, next sweet. Saturday, 3 o'clock Mountain Time. Thank you all. You guys rock. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>